Hello, and welcome to the Duke Endocrinology Conference. I'm Diana McNeil, Professor of Medicine at Duke University Medical Center. Today's program is titled Thyroid Cancer, and our distinguished guest is Ramon Escamado, Professor and Chief of the Division of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery at the Duke University School of Medicine in Durham, North Carolina. Ray, thanks so much for joining us. So, Ray, what can you tell us today about thyroid cancer? Well, that's a broad topic to cover in such Absolutely. a short period of time. Um, and I, what I've tried to do today is to, is to direct my comments um, on how would you, look, you would look at it and approach it as a primary care physician. Okay, that would be very um, useful to our audience. It's a common problem sometimes. It's quite common. Okay. And uh, more and more so now that we're finding nodules incidentally. Okay. And they're not even palpable. Okay. Well, tell us a little bit more about that. Well, um, I'd just like to first just kind of go over what really are the issues and the challenges that we have today and then try to lay a background of what the risk factors might be. All right. Um, then how you go about evaluating a thyroid nodule. Uh, once you do that appropriately, what the treatment recommendations are and, and how are these patients followed up, okay. which I think are all important. You'll, you'll run into that you know, as, you, as you care for patients in, in the primary care setting. Um, I think simply stated that um, it's really important to identify the 5% of patients or so that uh, have a thyroid nodule um, that is malignant in a kind of a cost-effective and um, minimally invasive manner. Everything we do has, has costs and something that's so prevalent um, and something that uh, has, can have significant side effects. I think we need to be very judicious in that. So most of our primary care physicians are going to just feel lumps and bumps in their that's head. That's correct. So, so you're going to give us some hints on how we can make sure it's thyroid because I'm pretty sure, sure. I probably sent you a few <laughs> patients that didn't have thyroid nodules that had a brachial cleft cyst or yeah. something else. Ho hopefully it won't be subtle, but, won't but be subtle. just more important principles also. Okay. Um, the first thing to remember is that thyroid nodules are very common. Okay. Um, they occur in about 5% of women and about 1% of men. Um, and if you were to randomly do ultrasounds, it can be up into two-thirds of patients uh, that you just do ultrasounds. And, and also, as I previously mentioned, we're finding more nodules that are non-palpable in routine CT scans, ultrasounds for carotids, mm -hmm. PET scans, mm -hmm. and what do we do with this? I actually received an email today from a colleague who did a scan for um, cervical neck pain, and, and they mentioned that they they saw thyroid nodules and he goes, now what am I supposed right. to do with it? So you're going to tell us. <laughs> um, the other uh, important consideration is that as we see more thyroid nodules, the incidence of thyroid cancer is increasing. Um, in 2009, there were almost 38,000 new cases. Uh, the incidence is about 3.6 per 100,000 mm. okay. uh, patients. Um, and the increase is almost all in papillary thyroid cancer. And papillary thyroid cancer is the most common type. It occurs, uh, it can be up to 85% or 90% of all thyroid cancers. And the vast majority that we're seeing are small. So the immediate question is, that are we finding them more because we're screening more? Or is there something in the environment that is causing patients to have more thyroid cancer? You know, there's been a lot of public... Yes. Uh, information and concern regarding radiation and exposure to that in causing thyroid cancer. So my guess is it's a combination of combination. Color. Okay. Um, the second important principle is is that from from my perspective, it's really important to tailor the surgical and the medical management okay. um, that optimizes the outcomes and minimizes the morbidity that we can have on these on these patients. Um, the reason why I say that is. Over 90% of the cancers are what we call well differentiated thyroid cancer, either papillary or follicular. And um, they generally have excellent prognosis. With low risk papillary thyroid cancer, the 10 to 15 year survivorship is over 98%. Oh, so we have to be careful not to over treat, but to treat appropriately. Um, unfortunately, there is a small set of patients with well differentiated thyroid cancer that they don't do well. They don't do and well. we don't understand why and, and how do we pick these patients mm -hmm. out to treat them more aggressively. Um, and then there's also the rare thyroid malignancies which are important to diagnose early to try to optimize uh, the cure. Um, and finally, 
how do we effectively and kind of in a cost-efficient way follow up patients long-term? Because they do require long-term follow-up since this is such a, generally such an indolent disease. A day of a month or six weeks or two months often is not good. So that's the first, okay. I guess, pearl. Okay. The flip, it, the opposite is true in children. In 20% of neck masses are neoplastic, whereas 80% okay. are inflammatory, and you can you can approach it in that way. If the neck mass hurts, is sore, is tender, does that make us feel better that it's less likely to be cancer, or not really? It depends on the history. Ah, if it okay. if it came up quickly with a cold and okay. it's tender and it's febrile, yes, it's more likely inflammatory. Um, you could have you know. You could have a tender thyroiditis. You could have a uh, you you can have an, a, a tender neoplastic neck mass, but those are rare. Generally, neck masses that are asymptomatic, other than being there, are the ones you worry about. But those are the ones that I see people worry less about because it's not causing symptoms. By the time there's a symptom, it's usually pretty advanced. And just practically, and your your diagram and your picture probably helps explain it better than I'm going to. A lot of our patients will come in and feel a neck mass right under their, their mandible, and those mm -hmm. are often not thyroid. Uh, that's right. lymph nodes that's often correct. or something else. The things that we worry about, thyroid-related masses will either be um, around the area of the, of the larynx, which is right here. Okay. Uh, the other thing it will do is it will rise. It'll elevate with swallowing because it's attached to the, usually the trachea or the, or the cricoid cartilage. Or if you have them stick their tongue out, it will rise a little bit. Oh, that's actually a great pearl. I have always been uh, telling all of our residents that they need to have a cup of water in the room if they're going to do an adequate thyroid exam mm -hmm. because you want them to swallow. So mm -hmm. that's actually a good point. The other thing is, is thyroid cancer could present as uh, metastasis in the lymph node. Mm. They most commonly are in the central compartment around the trachea, but it's difficult to feel those. Um, where they will present is in the internal jugular chain here or in the posterior triangle. Okay. And those are really, those will be asymptomatic. Okay. pebbles that you'll feel, and those those are not inflammatory okay. and should be evaluated early. Mm. This one would get a lot This of would get your attention. attention. Yes. Um, it, uh, the point here is, is that even in a neck mass that's benign, um, these goiters that grow um, are innocuous in that the patients adapt mm -hmm. to the airway compression, mm -hmm. and they just decrease their level activity slowly over mm -hmm. years. And you could say, well, it's because they're overweight or they have mm -hmm. COPD, but really it's airway compression. And often the airway compression is mistaken for asthma, okay. which when really, or wheezing, when it's really upper airway suction, which by our definition is what's called strider, which is really noisy breathing that's audible without a stethoscope on inspiration or tracing. When you see that, that implies that the airway is at least 70% narrowed and, and it becomes a more urgent situation. Okay, now if someone walked into a, one of our primary care physicians or extender's office and was experiencing Strider, in your opinion, is that a medical emergency? Do you need to admit the patient to the hospital? Do you need to call you and uh, Generally, uh, have them yes. meet them in the ER? <laughs> Generally, yes. yes. Strider is, uh, is for us a sign of impending airway obstruction. Okay. Um, sometimes people will be striders for a very long period of time. It will tell you that you do have some time. Often with these patients, you will have, um, their airway will be compromised, but they'll do okay. They'll get a cold. They'll get a little bit of narrowing, and the airflow is related to the fourth power of the oh. radius. So it's a dramatic decrease in airflow, okay. and they'll become very symptomatic. Okay. In that situation, steroids may be helpful acutely, but it doesn't obviate having the airway evaluated. It just reminded me why they make us take physics in medical school, mm -hmm. right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. that, that's, that's the... That's the um, yeah. And then when you're looking at one thing that's helpful to determine if the airway uh, is potentially a problem is, is what's called Pemberton sign. And if you have a patient raise both their arms directly above their head, they'll basically get a superior vena cava syndrome where they'll get dilated veins, uh, they'll flush, um, and they'll get shortness of breath, and you may have strider with that. Now, is this immediate raising, or do you hold your hands up for a you few minutes? You just hold it up for a hold little while. Yeah, it takes a little while to get okay. the congestion. Okay. Yeah. That's a pearl that might be helpful for yeah. a physical exam.
So in this situation, what, what we, it's a clinical assessment for us. I always get a CT scan if, if we can, um, if the airway allows us to look at the airway, where it's narrowed, the length of the narrowing, how much is in the chest um, in order to plan surgery. And usually I just try to decompress one side, but this lady needed both sides and she's done fine. She's happy with that. So one practical question. Let's say we're in a rural community and mm -hmm. we see a patient who's tried. Is there any benefit to the use of steroids to decrease any inflammation or is that not if it's any If it's not associated with a recent upper respiratory okay. infection or something that, that or some type of upper airway inflammation, it's unhelpful. Not helpful. Because okay. it, it's a fixed obstruction. All right. Um, and really the decision needs to be made is whether that patient should be intubated fairly, fairly emergently before mm. transport. But the vast majority of the time, this is a very long-standing okay. problem. Okay. And they'll come in. Okay. So um, those, are the, those are the kind of the pearls. Now, when you see a patient with what you determine to be a, a thyroid nodule, I think it's important uh, to determine what are the factors that make this more likely uh, to be cancer. All right. Um, and first is age. Um, in, a, in a person younger than 20, uh, the vast majority of these are malignant, up to 50%. Um, so those should be evaluated fairly expeditiously. Okay. Um, if there's a history of uh, exposure to ionizing radiation therapy, uh, many people will have a palpable nodularity in their gland. Um, the latency period is usually 20 to 30 years. So you need to really do a history then mm -hmm. because you might have missed it. Just Have you had any radiation? And they say not recently, but it's 20 years right. ago. You, usually we'll see it these days for um, tr treatment of Hodgkin's right. Right. Um, or in our field for treatment of head and neck. Okay. head and neck malignancy. Okay. Um, the days of having you treated for your thymus or acne. Uh, or acne or those kinds of things, we're seeing less and less of okay. those patients. Um, the risk does increase linearly with dose. Um, mm. In terms of nuclear exposure, uh, it's interesting that um, in Chernobyl, uh, the children less than 20 had a 60-fold increase mm. in thyroid malignancy, mm. um, and there was no, essentially no latency period. Oh, yeah. Um, and in Japan, um, uh, in the Second World War, sur survivors of that, there w the greatest risk was in, in kids less than 10. Um, you saw it in children or young adults up to 20, but there was, uh, when you were older than 20, there seemed to be some type of protective effect, and the incidence was not any different than the normal population. So older adults, not as worrisome. Now, here's a clinical saw that we've been taught. If we see a man with a solitary nodule, is it true that it's malignant until proven otherwise, or has that been disproven? I mean, you, you talked you know, about women having it more commonly, but when you're, well, when you're looking for risk factors for malignancy, uh, I used to think that being a male with a solid nodule was more high risk than yeah. if you were a female solid nodule. You know, I think we're close to the same vintage. And, and, uh, <laughs> I consider that an honor, by the way. That's an um, honor. <laughs> I, I was, I was uh, brought up thinking the same thing, yeah. and I... I, I have kind of tried to look at that a little bit more. What I, my understanding today is that um, the risk of malignancy in a nodule is the same. It's the same. Uh, okay. Regardless whether it's unilodular or multinodular. Um, in, if you see a nodule in a man, um, it's, it has a greater risk of cancer the older they are with a peak okay. incidence of about 65 or okay. so. In okay. women, the peak incidence is... 45 to 50, All right. and it's more likely to be a cancer. Okay. Um, so we talked about that. The other uh, important uh, historical uh, information is uh, what the family history is. Okay. The risk is higher in patients with um, a first-degree relative. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to ask about the possibility of uh, uh, syndromic um, malignancy, particularly uh, theosophic. Uh, medullary thyroid cancer and MEN2. Uh, That's multiple endocrine neoplasia yes. for those that might not be familiar with that. There's other Gardner syndrome, uh, colonic polyps and Kalman syndrome, which you see cutaneous and oral cavity uh, hematomas. Um, and those, those have an increased risk. Okay. Uh, the, the important thing for us is, and, and, and this um, I think is important in just kind of painting the picture, if you see a hard fixed mass, All right. particularly if it's unilateral. Um, 
that could be from a calcified nodule and you can't get a needle in that anyway. But if it's hard and fixed, that's got to raise your index of suspicion. If there's rapid growth or a painful mass, you have, you have to be suspicious. Um, if there's a vocal cord paralysis. Uh -huh. Now, the, the difficulty with that is you can have a compensated vocal cord paralysis that gives you nearly a normal voice. It will go un unrecognized. Okay. The other concern is, is that you can have a, a partially paralyzed, what we call a paretic vocal cord, that will also have a normal voice that you will not know unless you actually examine the voice box. And for, for us, if we see impaired mobility, that that's cancer to proven otherwise. So the internist is going to ask the surgeon, when you examine the patients we send to you with the solitary nodules, do you do a laryngoscopy mm -hmm. exam? Mm -hmm. And that's to assess the, the extent of any malignancy into the vocal cord? If, yeah, if, if the vocal cord doesn't move well, that implies that the recurrent nerve is mm -hmm. involved. involved. That makes it a T4 lesion. Ah. And that, it becomes difficult to get all of those out because if the nerve is involved, often the trachea or the esophagus or other associated structures can potentially be So that be serves as a map or some uh, information that will help guide your hand as you do the right. surgery. I see. Okay. Right. Patients ask us what you're going to do to them. And so it's helpful for us to know what to tell them sometimes, you know, in advance of their visit with you. Uh, and the other is lymphadenopathy. If they have lymph nodes okay. in the neck um, that are essentially non-tender and firm, um, you, you have to think thyroid. Um, so those are all important things in the physical exam. Um, again, I, li I, it's, I, like, I think it's important to have the cords examined in, in okay. all patients. That doesn't routinely occur. Um, I think that if you look at these risk factors in the history and physical, mm -hmm. it really helps you interpreting your diagnostic tests um, and helps you put the big picture together as to whether or not you, know, you should operate because sometimes they all, they all don't fit in the slots that we expect it to. All right. um, and again, we talked about the risk of malignancy being the same. Okay. Um, the other situation that we'll often come into is what do you do with the incidental loan? And everyone who's listening to our conversation, this is the common problem for our primary uh, health care providers that we're finding right. it, like you said at the beginning, so often now we're mm -hmm. not really sure what to do. Right. So tell us what to do. <laughs> well, this is what I suggest. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, the first thing to remember is that non-palpable nodule has the same uh, malignant risk as a similarly sized uh -huh. palpable nodule. So okay. if it's a short, thick neck, you can't feel into two centimeter nodule, same risk. Okay. Um, generally, uh, nodules only greater than a centimeter need to be evaluated unless there's something on ultrasound that, that makes it highly suspicious for malignancy. Now what happens if you have a nodule that's less than a centimeter, but they say there are lymph nodes noted in the area of the nodule? Um, that that is it has to raise your index of suspicion, but the issue is whether those lymph nodes appear abnormal on an ultrasound okay. or not. And there's characteristics. Okay, so that. just perhaps it might be not inappropriate to either re-examine the patient mm -hmm. in a few weeks or something else if the nodule's small, um, but if the exam is important. Yes. Okay. And again, it goes with the history. If they've okay. got high risk and they've got a nodule and nodes, okay. I would be a little bit more okay. aggressive in having that evaluated. Okay. And the, other, the common thing we'll see is, what do you do with a PET positive mm. module? Um, statistically, yeah, that's... This is what the PET scan that yes. people are doing they for just, lung cancer they and other it. things. Okay. If it's a solitary nodule and not the whole gland that lights up, the risk of malignancy is approximately 30%. Uh -huh. And it's more often a primary thyroid malignancy than it is a metastasis in a patient that has a sec, an, another, another malignancy, kind of which cancer. is often why we find them they're screening okay. for a metastatic okay. disease. But so the long and short of it is we should follow up on a PET yes. positive nodule. Yes. A 33% malignancy rate is very high. That's very high. It's very high. Yes, and those should be evaluated. Okay. So this is, this is the other key. Once you have a thyroid nodule, what is the next step? Uh -huh. In the past, um, you, you, you get a radionuclide scan. Right. Um, now, the, really, the standard is to get a TSH. All right. Um, because, Thyroid stimulating. Yes. Hormone. Okay. Yes. And the, the reason for that is um, if you have an elevated TSH okay. um, with a nodule, that usually implies you have a hyperfunctioning nodule, and the patient will usually be hyperthyroid, and the incidence of malignancy in that is very low. 
two percent, maybe maybe five percent, but very low. And and those don't need to be evaluated um, with ultrasound or needle biopsy. So if the TSH is suppressed, 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 so right. low, TSH, low TSH, then you have a hyperfunctioning nodule, and we don't need to evaluate those. Would you do a scan on them, perhaps? Yes. Okay. So yes. that's when we would go yes. with the scan. Mm -hmm. That okay. would confirm whether okay. it's. It's whether it's the whole gland. Yeah. Or so it's for many of us who are seeing patients um, for the first time in, in primary care, we hope to see the TSH suppressed because that actually maybe makes us less worried. Yes. But it's not a hundred percent. No. Okay. And not. that used to be the teaching is if someone had a hyperfunctioning nodule that we didn't need to worry about malignancy as much. Right. That's correct. And that's yeah. where the the referral to the endocrinologist is yeah. is, is perfectly okay. appropriate. There. Good. Good. And less so the surgeon. Because you don't really want to operate on those unless medical okay. management fails. Okay. Um, the second is if the TSH is normal, so they're euthyroid, or the TSH is elevated, so they're hypothyroid, then and they have a nodule, then that needs to be evaluated because okay. the risk of malignancy um, is higher then. Um, once you have that, the, the, the next step is a thyroid ultrasound. Okay. Um, and Again, a thyroid ultrasound, the recommendation is it's an all, you do it in all patients with known or suspected thyroid nodules with a normal or elevated TSH. Um, this brings us to ultrasound. The only procedure we now have in endocrinology is thyroid ultrasound and finding aspirates. We're trying to be like you. But that's uh, so. But it's, it, but it's something that has really changed in the last couple of years. Yes. So... Tell us what we need to find on the ultrasound. I don't know. Well, um, first, it, the, the ultrasound is very, very operator dependent. Right. Um, and if you um, have depend on a radiologist mm -hmm. to do the ultrasound, often you you will look at the report, and it, it will, may describe nodules, but it may not give you all the information you need to determine which nodules need to be biopsied. Okay. So. Um, I personally like to do my own ultrasounds. It gives okay. me a lot of information and a sense of, of what's going on okay. and what needs to be biopsied. Okay. Um, the, the, the ultrasound findings that are suspicious for malignancy are several, and none of them are absolutely pathognomonic for okay. it, but they all um, give a higher suspicion. First, if you have a nodule, if the dimension on the um, axial or the axial plane is um, it's taller rather than wide. Um, if you see microcalcifications, um, if there, if if it's hypoechoic in relation to the gland, okay. um, if you don't have a halo or the borders are irregular, um, if the if on Doppler you have a lot of blood blood flow okay. uh, in the nodule that's central, or if you have lymph nodes that are suspicious that are rounded that you, they don't have a, a fatty hyaline, that they have a lot of peripheral vascularity, or if there's microcalcifications. And this is just an example of one of my, my own okay. ultrasounds. This disorientation, here's the trachea. Okay. This is the carotid artery. So here is the thyroid gland here. Right. And you see this? This is just a little microcalcification. In the thyroid gland. In the nodule. Here's the there's nodule. nodule right? But see, here, here is the capsule of the thyroid gland. Then here it is here in the nodule, in the lateral surface, and right here, you lose the capsule, oh. and it's in the straps. So there's no halo. No, well the halo is actually hypoechoic. Okay. So there's really you can't really see a good halo here, but there's no capsule here. Right. So that that tells you it may be out of the Maybe. thyroid, and that is that is a worrisome mm -hmm. nodule for me, and it's got a lot of flow. Yeah. And if you look at this gland, you see these little punched out lesions. It's right. starting to look like Swiss cheese. Right. So that's what you see in Hashimoto's right. gland. Um, and Marked heterogeneity. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and, and those also have a higher incidence of papillary thyroid cancer. Okay. So in all of that, you, that's got to really raise. So I want to, what you just said is I think really important to reemphasize. A lot of our patients will become hypothyroid. They're followed by primary care providers for years. If you should still examine the neck. And if you find a nodule in someone who's been on thyroid replacement and has presumed diagnosis of Hashimoto's, that does carry a higher incidence yes, of does. malignancy. So we need to be examining the neck. Yes. I mean, don't just manage the TSH yes. labs. Okay. And the, the, that's the, a really good point. That's a great point. And the difficulty with that is a Hashimoto's gland in itself can feel firm. That's right. And kind of nodular and funny, but you've got to look at change over time. Okay. okay. Um, 
So once we know we have a suspicious gland, a suspicious nodule, okay. uh, the next step really is, is a, a fine needle aspiration biopsy. Um, the nodules that, I guess I'd say the nodules we don't worry about okay. are ones that are purely cystic. All right. With no solid component at all. Those those are not cancer, and those okay. do not need to be biopsied. Spongiform nodules that are a lot of microcystic components that are all together. Okay. It's more than half of that. The likelihood of cancer is low. Um, again, if it's less than a centimeter in size, or unless it looks highly suspicious, this is particularly important when you have a nodule that is on the back side of the gland right. against the trachea or against the recurrent nerve or the esophagus or a vital structure. Okay. You probably want to be a little bit more aggressive in that because that can invade yeah. um, the, the adjacent structures early, early as a small nodule. Um, the, the next issue is do you do it? by just palpation, or yeah. when do you do an ultrasound? Yeah, we call it ultrasound. blind FNA, blind. which some of our listeners may actually do in their own offices because it's not uh, FNAs are not always done just by endocrinologists now, particularly the blind one. So you, the answer to this question is important for us because we all yeah. have struggled whether or not it's the standard of care now to do ultrasound-directed fine needle aspirates. Yeah. I, w as, as surgeons, we're a little bit more puffed up. Uh, okay. So we, <laughs> <laughs> so we call them d directed Directed, directed biopsies. Directed biopsies, okay. <laughs> but, um, yes, um, when, when should you use it? Uh, for those of us who use ultrasound, it's kind of the standard because right. you, you see you can, in a, right. in, a, in a mixed nodule, you can put the needle right into right. the solid component, which is what you want. You can put okay. it in the wall. Um, it's really the most accurate way to do okay. it. Um, but if there's one that's easily palpable, you can, you can, and you don't have an ultrasound readily right. available, you can get a needle biopsy and it may give you the answer. Okay. But, you know, you worry about um, appropriate sensitivity. Okay. All right. So the ones that, that really it's indicated is if you have done a blind biopsy okay. and okay. It, it hasn't given you an answer, if it's, if it's really suspicious on ultrasound, you can't feel it. If you have a mixed component that you really want to biopsy the solid component, or if, again, a poorly palpable nodule, one of those incidental ailments. Okay. Um, uh, and when you get the needle biopsy, what do you do with it? And you're going to get certain reports, and this is kind of the best that I could put it okay. together. Um, you'll the get first a, one is the one we don't like to get, right. which is the non-diagnostic right. report. And when you get that, you can, you can repeat it again, and you'll often have another a successful biopsy. But if it continues to be non-diagnostic, what do you do with it? This is where the history and the physical exam and the patient level of comfort becomes important okay. in terms of what to do, whether to do the definitive thing, which is to take it out. So the, a lot of the ones that I've gotten back recently that have been non-diagnostic start out with non-diagnostic abundant blood. So the query comes up is if they re-aspirate it, they're going to get abundant blood a second time. Is that a situation where we would send them to you perhaps or not so much? Um, you or mean to do another biopsy? Or to take it out? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Again, yeah, it, it depends yeah. clinically yeah. what, the, yeah. what okay. the patient's level of threshold is and, and, yeah. and what the level of concern okay. that, this, that this is. You know, the bigger ones, yes, yeah. we would. Yeah, I think then we go back to the, the criteria you gave us earlier right. about things that make you worried about a right. malignant nodule. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's the one we don't like, uh, okay. but we get it. Not infrequently. Okay. Uh, diagnostic of malignancy is almost always papillary thyroid cancer or, or medullary or anaplastic, but rarely follicular. They, you can't make that diagnosis yeah. on the needle. And that's, that's greater than 95% correct. Um, suspicious carries a 50 to 75% risk. Follicular or herthal cell neoplasm is a 20 to 30%. So what's herthal cells? Herthal cells. That's a variant of... Um, uh, follicular neoplasm, the cells are just bigger, they're more, um, what's the right term? They're, they're purple, that's what I remember when we look at the pathology slides, they look sort of like a, a big splotch of purple. Uh, yeah. The thing that we struggle with, Ray, is that you know uh, some of the herthal cell neoplasms are not always malignant. Right. And, but if we don't know, that's another reason to send the patient right. to you, if we get that biopsy report back. Right. 
and yeah, because herthel cell carcinoma is a, is a slightly more aggressive variant ah, so, than follicular. So be aggressive yes. if you're the if you're the primary care yes. physician getting that report mm-hmm. back. Okay. Yes. Okay. And uh, there's also the atypical or follicular lesion of undetermined significance that, that that has been now split apart from follicular neoplasm or hypercellular, and that carries a smaller risk. Okay. Um, and finally, benign. Um, it, it's uh, uh, you can see the difference if if you do it with a directed or a blind FNA. There's yeah. a one to three percent risk that you've missed the cancer. Okay. With a with an ultrasound guided FNA, it's less than one okay. percent. So if you see the patient and it's a benign nodule, are you done? Um, and the answer is no. Okay. Um, if you have a benign or atypical, or uh, it does require some follow-up. Normally, the ultrasound is repeated in 6 to 18 months. Um, if the nodule changes okay. uh, in terms of a greater than 50% increase in volume or a 2 millimeter or 20% or 2 millimeter increase in two dimensions, okay. um, that's an indication for um, a repeat needle biopsy. If the nodule is stable, uh, you can then follow it every three to five years. So repeat the ultrasound once. If stable, do it again in three years or three so. Years, yes. Now, patients will ask this, and I know you and I maybe know the answer. They're worried about radiation exposure from ultrasounds. That's a, not something to worry no, about. No, yeah, there's no radiation. That's what, what I always tell patients, but mm-hmm. I think it's useful to remember, yeah. uh, remember to remind ourselves that. And finally, if you have a cyst that, that's not a pure cyst that recurs repeatedly, mm-hmm. usually three or four times, it should be. Okay. All right. Now, what I've been struggling with, and I think maybe our, our listeners might also be struggling with, we have patients who come with multi-nodular thyroids. Mm-hmm. So you'll have a nodule that meets all your criteria for finding a aspirate and another one that's on the borderline. Is it common to need to aspirate several nodules? Yes. Okay. And yes. so um, you should treat each nodule in a multi-nodular thyroid gland independently. That's correct. Okay, because I think in the old days, again, when I was starting out as an endocrinologist, we were taught that the chance of having a malignancy in a multinodular gland was considerably less than a solitary nodule. Yes, that's, that, that's, how, I, that's how I learned it, too. Yeah, and that, but, that has changed. That has changed. Mm-hmm. Okay, so now we're very aggressive and treat them just like you mentioned right. a solitary nodule Correct. should be assessed. Okay. Okay. Okay, now we're in your in your operating room here. Okay, so well, we're getting close to being now, your now, operator. Now, the, now's when it gets fun. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, what it what it, so now if you've determined that the surgery is is warranted, um, what are the recommendations okay. for that? Okay. The the most important um, determinant of survivorship in a non-metastatic thyroid cancer is complete surgical resection. Okay. Um, so that that's critical. Um, you want to do that and minimize uh, the complications such as hoarseness or bilateral vocal cord paralysis or hypoparathyroidism and lifelong th- uh, calcium replacement, which is, can be quite a nuisance in, yes. a, young, in a young person. Um, and the other complications associated with neck dissection. So um, that, that's important. As I go more and more in this, you realize how much harm you can do patients. So you, I, I tend to be very more on the conservative okay. side in that. Um, you also want to get out all the disease to facilitate radioactive, postoperative radioactive iodine treatment. Um, you don't want a lot of residual thyroid acting as kind of a vacuum kind of sucking up all your I-131 and, and rendering it ineffective. So after they're done with what you're going to describe in a few minutes, I think about surgical mm-hmm. removal. We're not done with the treatment because no. you do have to go back and make sure there's no residual thyroid Correct. tissue. Correct. And we use that iodine. And that's done by the endocrinologist yes. sometimes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and again, the goal is to minimize recurrence mm-hmm. uh, and distant metastasis. Okay. Um, and also it helps us, helps the endocrinologist primarily with long-term surveillance and follow-up. At this point, the patient is under the care of specialists. Is yes. that correct? Yes. Oh. Okay, so this is just to overemphasize the, the importance of completeness of resection. Um, the, this is just an example. Uh, this is a patient that, that originally had a follicular carcinoma that was not felt to be resectable and got radiation. Mm. And it continued to grow, and we ended up 
doing a total thyroidectomy. What you see here, this is the larynx, this is the trachea. This is the half of the trachea removed. And then this is the mucosa inside, and this is kind of a little rent there. Basically, there's no, you can't get an airway. The patient will not breathe unless you do something to that. The nerve has been cut, so we have to do something to make the voice better, because it's not only the voice that is important, but if, if they have a vocal cord palace, many of the patients can't swallow, and they'll aspirate. So it does affect many other things. Um, we just did it. We just did a graft here to re... re uh, these are cartilage grafts to re-establish the, the tracheal skeleton. And we put vascularized tissue in there to help um, with the healing. So I'm sure many of our listeners are thinking, oh, my goodness, when I send a patient for a thyroid resection, does Dr. Ray yeah. have to do this? Oh, this is a very, this is metastatic very, disease. Very, this, is, this is actually a um, disease that has grown outside of the larynx, okay. T4 disease, which carries a poor prognosis. And the reason why it does is often you don't get all the disease out. If you can get all the disease out and not in, and preserve the patient's function of speech and swallowing okay. and airway, okay. then you can really help the patient. And when you operate to, to remove the thyroid nodule, how do you confirm that you haven't done anything to the parathyroid glands? I, patients ask me about this all the mm -hmm. time because they're right behind the thyroid. Mm -hmm. Do you check intraoperative parathyroid levels or do you implant one in the arm or what do you do to make I, sure that it's um, not that they're all there i well what i tell the residents is, is you have to know your anatomy okay and and tech and from a technique standpoint you have to preserve the blood supply of the parathyroid okay. Okay. and 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 that's a knowledge of, of where it is and how it comes and, and okay. being able to recognize i think i think actually thyroid surgery is harder because you're trying to preserve normal parathyroid glands and there's been great mystique in parathyroid surgery because you're taking out these glands, but right. they're big right. and they're abnormal and you're taking them out. And that's actually easier. Right. Um, and the, the, the challenge is really preserving the parathyroid glands, particularly when you're removing the lymph nodes alongside the windpipe because they're all intimately involved. So you have to be able to recognize them. When you see them and preserve them, it's just visual. No, it's a, a, visual. a healthy parathyroid gland will keep its tan color. If they turn black, they've been devascularized and often... I'll take it, uh, take a piece of it to confirm it's that and not metastatic cancer, and then implant it either in a forearm or in a healthy muscle. And that survivorship is about 90% of the time. When you implant it? Yes, really? the, gland, the gland will survive. Okay. That's, that's interesting. So you have to, you know, fortunately we have four of them. You only need one. That's true. Um, that so true. there is a little bit of a buffer. The reason I think it's helpful to have you explain this to us is honestly patients will ask us mm. these details. Um, in anticipation of meeting you. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's helpful for us to understand what you're going to do when you go into the mm -hmm. neck. And it sounds like it's uh, important to know the anatomy. Well, if, if, thyroid, if thyroid surgery didn't have recurrent laryngeal nerves and parathyroids, it'd be very easy. It'd be very easy. Okay. Because <laughs> the gland generally is very That's easy right. to remove. Okay. So anyway, this is the airway. It's a good airway, and he did fine. Um, so what do we do with... What is the appropriate amount of surgery? Because we're always thinking about the potential complications. Okay. Um, generally, if you have a, 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 a fine needle that's a diagnostic of malignancy uh, and the tumor is intrathyroidal and less than a centimeter, unifocal, just one nodule on, C, on, on ultrasound, it can be managed by lobectomy. That's one side, you leave the other side uh, in? Yes, okay. with no other nodules on the other side. Um, but you would look at the other side. Yes, while you're in there. yes, okay. and you also know that on your preoperative okay. ultrasound. Okay. Um, that that I would say most of the time we do total thyroid. That's what I was going to say. Um, because it has been shown to reduce recurrence rates and increase survival in patients with nodules greater than a centimeter. Okay. Um, and certainly total thyroidectomy for any of the ag aggressive cell types uh, with appropriate uh, neck dissection, which I'll touch on later. Um, if you have a FNA that's a follicular or herthal cell neoplasm, clearly you have to take the lobe. That's the safest way to do it uh, in terms of nerve preservation and parathyroid preservation. Um, I tell the patients there's a 30% there's a chance this is cancer. They won't be able to tell us that, and we may need to go back in a second stage to take the other side out. What I have often taught the residents is that when we aspirate those nodules and they come back with follicular pathology, mm -hmm. the only difference between a malignancy and an adenoma is extension past the capsule is that still your thinking and that's yes. why and that's why you say 
you go in, you do the lobe, you then do the, the pathology, you see if it's a malignancy or an adenoma, then you mm -hmm. may have to go back and do something else. Right. Is that is right. they, they, explaining they, it correctly to what, patients? What the pathologists are looking for are either capsular invasion or vascular invasion, okay. which tells you that it's malignant. For those two types of cell types, follicular and herpes cell. Follicular and herpes okay. cell, that's correct. Okay. okay. So um, total thyroid jet. Total thyroidectomy is generally recommended for high-risk nodules, big ones, mm -hmm. more than four centimeters. Mm -hmm. If there's significant activity on the needle biopsy, if it's suspicious for papillary thyroid, family history of radiation exposure. I, I will candidly, the extent of thyroidectomy is very individualized in my practice. I tend to do a total thyroidectomy in, in a history of radiation exposure with multiple nodules. I don't like to take the whole gland out if it's just a solitary nodule without actual confirmation that it's cancer, especially in younger people, because they okay. do well, and you know, lifelong thyroid or, or calcium replacement is is significant in life. Okay. So, I tend to really individualize that. Okay. Oh, I haven't seen pictures like this in many years not since I did my surgery rotation. <laughs> well, this is this is the that was the thyroid. So generally, okay. it's total thyroidectomy, okay. and very rarely a lobe. Um, um, what do we do with the neck? And this is an area of great controversy and mm -hmm. I think hopefully evolving. Um, it's important to we divide the, no, the, the neck into regions. Mm. Um, this is the sternocleidomastoid muscle and the internal jugular vein is there. Everything here is what we call the internal jugular nodes behind the sternocleidomastoid muscle and the um, trapezius is the spinal accessory lymph nodes it's a com and the transverse cervical lymph nodes here. These are common routes of involvement of, of thyroid cancer. Um, the most common is level six, which is really from the hyoid bone down to the sternal notch. From the sternal notch down to the, vet, the great vessels is level seven, which is still considered part of the central compartment and which is removed. Um, this is the thyroid gland removed. These are the, your, your level six is your pretracheal lymph nodes and then your paratracheal lymph nodes. The importance of these are these will live under the nerve, above the nerve. They'll be in relation to the thyroid gland. And my experience has been you can safely do surgery there with minimal risk of hypoparathyroidism, except in patients that have large lymph nodes. There. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard to find the parathyroids and or preserve the blood supply. When our extenders or, or primary care physicians are examining the patient post operatively, if they feel any little lumps or bumps in the areas that you just described, that would strike me as being worrisome, potentially. It is. The, 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 the difficulty with this area is it's difficult to feel a paratracheal node. Usually you're feeling a level mm -hmm. four node lateral to the thyroid. Okay. Okay. Uh, and the other difficulty is, is that with the thyroid in place, it's difficult to see the paratracheal lymph nodes on the ultrasound. So okay. in terms of using that to stage them, it's very hard and you have to do it clinically when, when you get in there. I'm pretty sure I'm referring them to you. So, <laughs> um, so this is kind of um, a little bit of a digression on neck decision. I think it's important to understand what we're doing and, okay. and, and what the implications of that are. Um, a therapeutic neck decision, we use therapeutic when there are actually clinically positive nodes. Okay. It's not microscopic disease. All right. Um, and that occurs in about 30% of patients um, will actually have palpable nodes. Um, it's, uh, it's either preoperatively or intraoperatively once you've removed the gland and you can feel that nodes are clearly abnormal. Okay. Um, again, a preoperative neck ultrasound is recommended. Uh, in, on a CT scan, an abnormal node is something more than a centimeter here, more than five to eight millimeters with, with the features that I talked about. Uh, again, it's not useful in the central compartment. That, this is an area that, that I tend to be more conservative on because a five to eight millimeter node is microscopic disease. And, and in the past, it's been effectively treated with radioactive iodine and adding a neck dissection I, I, I'm not sure we have good data to justify that at this okay. point, but that is one of the recommendations. It's not with strong evidence, but it is a recommendation. Okay. Um, a radical neck dissection, which is the term that most people are familiar with, is rarely necessary. Okay, okay. so that's important information yes. because I think a lot of patients that's assume well that right. everything's going to be right. cut out of their neck. A radical neck dissection Im implies removing the non-lymphatic structures, the sternocleidomastoid muscle, the vein, and the 11th nerve, which gives you your shoulder uh, dysfunction. 
um, you, you rarely, even with big nodes, thyroid cancer, metastatic thyroid cancer in lymph nodes rarely invades surrounding structures, so okay. you can save those. Okay. Um, very picky, yeah. just kind of pulling out the nodes that are involved um, is not recommended. There's yeah. a lot of uh, additional disease in the right. neck, so you have to be able to do that well. And in the paratracheal nodes, you have to really be able to know your parathyroid anatomy and, and manage those well. Okay. Um, and I put this picture up not for shock value, but just to drive home the point um, that... That we need surgeons. Yes. Okay. <laughs> there are a lot of bad things in there, uh, and you need to be able to know your way around and uh, preserve them to give the patient the best function. You can do a neck dissection and preserve every vital nerve structure and essentially leave the patient with very little other than a scar and perhaps some um, a little tightness in the neck. Okay. Um, but that, that needs to be done well, because once you get in there and it recurs in the neck, that's, that's a real problem. Okay. Now, the second term is elective neck dissection. Um, that, for, an N, for a clinical N0 neck, is, uh -huh. is controversial, uh -huh. particularly for the paratracheal and level 6 and 7 nodes. Um, you will find in, in the Japanese literature, they, di they dissect necks regularly. Okay. And microscopically, even for early stage disease, they'll find microscopic cancer in up to 90% of patients. Of course, if you look. If you look. But it doesn't, what, what does that mean? Right. What does that mean in terms of impact? And there's very little when you're using a radioactive iodine. Okay. Um, currently, uh, re the recommendation is, is to do an elective neck, at least ipsilateral on the paratracheal, but sometimes bilateral if the tumor is more than uh, T3 or more okay. uh, because it helps you stage, it helps determine post-operative radioiodine. Again, just for our listeners, these kinds of conversations will be most often had with you yes. and the patient. Yes. And so when patients come back to us and say, should I get a total thyroidectomy or a lobectomy, I would probably then defer back to the conversation they yes. had with you regarding the lymph node yes. and other things. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that, that's an important thing, and, okay. and, and it'll come up in follow-up when you do ultrasounds to follow the neck. Okay. You know, what do you do with that small okay. microscopic cancer in the neck? All so, right. So, um, and the okay, so iodine. now I'm getting a little bit of into your area here, but I'll do the best I can. All right, with all you. right. I know you'll help me out. I'll here. help you out. Um, what, are the, what are the treatment recommendations and the role of, of radioiodine? Okay. I think first it's important to, that we need to stage these patients. Mm -hmm. And part of the argument of doing more of a neck dissection is it, it, it lets you pathologically stage the neck okay. and upstage the patients if, okay. if necessary. Um, uh, and I won't go through the staging. That's, no, that's easily know. available. That's a lot of stuff. Um, but ultimately, what are the goals of, of okay. radioiodine? Uh, they're clearly distinct, but they're interrelated. Um, the first goal is what is considered remnant ablation. Um, if there's any residual thyroid gland that may have left the most common place of the superior polar right where the cricoid in the first ring, there's usually a little bit of thyroid tissue that's tucked in there. Sometimes you can't get it out because the nerve is very close and you're risking injuring the nerve. There'll be a little uptake there. Um, but it helps with helping you stage it and, um, it and if you ablate the remnant, it helps you detect recurrent disease down the line. Um, the second goal is for adjuvant therapy. If they're considered high right. risk and right. high risk for uh, unproven metastasis. So I recently had a patient who had diffuse nodules in his lung, and mm -hmm. and it was clear that he needed our radioactive iodine therapy to eliminate what was lung metastasis mm -hmm. from his thyroid cancer, and uh, and uh, probably has a reasonably excellent prognosis down the road if, if mm -hmm. caught early and, yeah. and treated aggressively. And that's the third indication, is, right. is radioiodine therapy for known I was helping you. residual <laughs> disease. Yeah. Okay. So, um, what are the indications for ablation? If you have known distant metastasis, if there's gross extrathoroidal extension, which will make it a T4 okay. uh, primary. Yeah. The tumor is big, yeah. uh, greater than four yeah. centimeters. If you have lymph node metastasis or other high-risk features. So I think one important thing you have on this slide that's worth discussing with our listeners is what the patient's going to say to them as we get ready to do um, the I-131 ablation because these patients don't feel well. They are taken off, as you have on your slide there, 
all of their thyroid replacement because often you've already done the surgery and you've mm -hmm. taken out their thyroid and now they're hypothyroid. And we take them off of it so that they become iodine avid mm -hmm. and they feel horribly. And so they'll call their primary care provider and complain about how poorly they feel. Um, the other thing that many of us do to make them even more iodine avid is change their diet. They don't like us for that either. So they eat an iodine deficient diet. So you, they're done with you. They're now with me. So, But I think it's important for our listeners yes. to know what will be happening between the time they finish with their surgery and the time they get scanned for right. any recurrent disease. Right. And so they'll be off thyroid hormone. They will be on an iodine restricted diet. So they will become iodine avid. And then there has to be some planning mm -hmm. uh, for the ex the amount of iodine that they're going to get with regard to family members and children mm -hmm. and drinking water and urine and other things that may have iodine in right. them. It, yeah, it, yeah it, it, it changes their life for a little bit. A little bit. But you know what? It cures their disease many times. So, so we have, that's one way to encourage them. Is right. that really, yeah. they, they will do well. Um, and... Um, this is what Diana just mentioned, that ablation requires yeah. uh, thyroxine withdrawal. Right. Okay. So once you have done the ablation, then there's suppression. Okay. And why do we do it? Um, first of all, it's, it's the concept that uh, well-differentiated thyroid cancer expresses uh, TSH receptor and it responds to TSH mm -hmm. stimulation. Mm -hmm. So... If you give super physiologic doses, mm -hmm. you then suppress that, mm -hmm. and, and it reduces mm -hmm. the risk of recurrence, which mm -hmm. has been shown. And the, and how much do you do it? Mm -hmm. um, again, it's it's risk. Mm -hmm. um, we have to know the complications. They can get thyrotoxic uh, in patients with coronary artery disease. They can get angina. Uh, you can get atrial fibrillation, and in women uh, that are postmenopausal, you can get osteoporosis. So um, you don't want to suppress everyone kind of super maximally. And, and the current recommendation is is that if a patient is a, is low risk, that you suppress them to TSH of 0.1 to, uh, 0 .1 to 0. With T4. With T4. With T4. So T4. For exogenous yeah. symptom. And our intermediate and high risk, it's less than 0.1. And this is a really important point to emphasize with our listeners because they often are the ones who are monitoring the thyroid laboratories yes. in the interim. And sometimes if you don't understand why someone has a suppressed TSH, you will be tempted to decrease their dose of T4, which would be a wrong clinical decision. Right. Okay. And it's important to know what their risk is, where you want okay. to see it. Okay. Um, so often you can help with that and it saves the patient okay. a lot. They can follow up with the primary care physician. Okay. Um, and, f and so once you have them on the immediate suppression, how do you follow them? And what, okay. what do we do from a long-term management guideline? Um, really, the goal is accurate surveillance. That's right. uh, we want to be able to identify the high-risk patients and monitor them more aggressively so we can detect their recurrences. Um, and we want to, patients that are low risk, you want to be able to suppress them appropriately mm -hmm. so we don't get the complications. Okay. Um, when we think about that, how do we define a someone who is disease-free? Really, we don't have thyroid cancer. It's a few things. One, there's nothing on physical exam. Okay. Uh, there's no imaging evidence of tumor, ultrasound. Um, and you, don't, you, there, you can't detect serum thyroglobulin during uh, TSH suppression or stimulation, and they have to have negative antibodies. If you have uh, antithyroglobulin antibodies, um, that's not a which a percentage accurate. of the population yes. has. So you have to check both the thyroid globulin, which is the precursor to all of your thyroid yes. hormones. So you theoretically should have no thyroid globulin left if you have taken it's out all the thyroid, and right. I have gotten rid of it, the rest right. of it with the iodine. Right. So the teamwork. Yeah, and if the thyroid globulin is very high, there's other right. reasons for it. But one is there's still there's still sure. thyroid tissue in there. Okay. So uh, the recommendation is to is to uh, screen the the uh, serum thyroglobin every six to 12 months in, a, in addition with the thyroglobin antibody. Okay. Um, in the low-risk patients who have had remnant ablation, uh, have a negative neck ultrasound, an undetectable TSH, um, w when, they're f when they're suppressed, that uh, they can have a yearly exam or a withdrawal and a stimulated thyroglobin okay. in one year. Okay. If patients have persistent disease, you have to keep them suppressed. Patients with metastatic disease, um, and they're high risk but disease free. Um, they're recommended to keep the TSH between 0.1 and 0.5. Okay. For five to ten years. 
Um, in low-risk patients, you can make the TSH come up a little bit to low normal. Um, and if you're disease-free and undergone red mole abla ablation, um, again, low end of normal for usually three to five years. So, so is there ever a time in the, in the course, because we, we're taking care of young people now with thyroid cancer, mm -hmm. where you can let that TSH drift back up 20 years from now if they've had no evidence of disease? Yes. You I, can let it up, drift yeah. back up into the normal range. I think you can if, okay. if you have... Again, the criteria, yeah. and particularly if they have a, a stimulated, if they have an undetectable stimulated thyroglobulin, that's that's pretty good that they're, they're okay. truly disease-free and you can rise after three to five years. Okay. Very good. Well, you've given us a wonderful, wonderful summary of a, of a disease process that can be quite perplexing, I think, to some of our, our listeners. So thank you so much. Thank you. It was, it was a pleasure. Yeah. Our guest faculty today has been Raymond Escomado, one of my colleagues here at Duke. Ray, thanks again for joining Thank us you. for an excellent discussion. Until next time then, from all of us here at Duke, this is Diana McNeil saying thanks for joining us and take care.